Welcome marketing chefs. I've got something truly special cooking in the Omni Channel oven today. Marketing Kitchen TV Q&A Live Part 4 of 4. You ask the question about all things related to the A, B, C, D, M hits. What does that stand for? I will be answering your questions about advertising, branding, communications, digital, and marketing. And what do the hits stand for? Hyperconnected, IoT, technology and sales. And I'll answer your questions here today in the Marketing Kitchen TV Q&A Live. Up next in the Marketing Kitchen. Welcome to the kitchen, the marketing kitchen. Hi, I'm Ron Vining, your host of Marketing Kitchen TV. Rather than take the time to do the standalone Q&A like I've been doing, I thought that I would change it up a bit and I would just go through the Twitter feed and answer as many questions as I can. And if the video gets too long, I'll cut it up into two or three different videos. Welcome back to another episode of Marketing Kitchen TV Q&A Live. And what I mean by live is that this should run without edits, or at least with just a few tweaks here and there, just for flow. The reason why I'm going to start doing more videos like this is so that I can actually get them posted. I have a hard drive full of videos that I have recorded, but I don't have the time to edit them, so I haven't put them up to YouTube. They were recorded, so they would be edited. I don't know if you know what I mean, right? So this one, I'm going to record knowing that I'm not going to edit, so the mindset is different. But if you're going to produce a video and create it where you'll have edits, then you record differently. So those videos are sitting on my hard drive. One of these days, I'm going to have the time to edit them. And one of the reasons why I like to edit is, I don't know if you can hear a baby crying outside my kitchen window here. Things just kind of happen when you're recording live, but I've watched a number of YouTube channels where dogs are barking, alarms are going off, people are walking around in the background. So I guess it's, I guess it's all fair game when recording in this style. Uh, for those of you that notice that the background is different, well actually if you take a look here uh, where my mouse is pointing, I'm standing right here. And in fact, this picture hasn't been updated because I have my new 34 inch monitor right here. And my laptop is sitting here, monitor sitting here, and I'm standing here. So you're seeing this shot over here of the kitchen. So a little bit different than our usual. But this enables me to do a split screen record and be able to take a look at your Twitter questions here. I really want to apologize that my videos have not been so frequent in the past month. And there's a reason for it. Hopefully it's a good reason. So this video is sponsored by myself. Now this is sponsored by a new company that I've started. And the name of that company is AppFlix, and it's right here. And AppFlix is you're going to be your streaming entertainment guide, where I'm going to be taking a look at the best of uh, video games, music, and then video in terms of uh, films and series that'll be streaming across all uh, our favorite apps. And some of them are in the picture here, but uh, you know what I mean by apps, right? We're talking about Disney Plus, uh, Netflix, uh, HBO Max coming out soon, CBS All Access. That's for the programming side, so films and TV series. But we'll also be looking at Apple Music and Apple Arcade for music and gaming, looking at Google Stadia and uh, YouTube Music for the Google aspect of that. Uh, um, also, Amazon. Uh, Prime, and they have uh, music, they've got Twitch for gaming, etc. So there's a lot of, uh, of apps that are coming out in the streaming space covering gaming, music, and your favorite films and shows. So I thought I'd create a website that focused in on that. So the, my plug will be over in a second. But AppFlix is going to have uh, three key components to it. 
One is going to be the news, and so the news is this area here called Cinetaste, where we'll talk about the latest buzz in the industry, things that are popular, and then we'll compare streaming services that are available. Then another section is going to be, uh, well, is Cinejules, where we're going to have forums. That's where there will be a discussion blogs or things similar to, say, like a LinkedIn group, where people can talk about their um, the streaming services, programming, etc. Be able to review your favorite content of, again, games, music, and, uh, and video, as well as a best of. And I've decided to build in some gamification here. And just a little quick, uh, Rotten Tomatoes uh, has tomatoes. I've got peppers. So we've got a pepper scale going from cold all the way to spicy. So icy or spicy is how it's going to work on this particular platform. So I think you'll find that fun. And with more gamification, I have a thing called a scorcher scale, which as something is, is trending, so as it's getting spicy, the meter is going to rise. On when, and when content isn't good, it's going to fall in the opposite direction. Anyway, it's a work in progress. Just launched it on November 25th. And the gamification piece, the forums, and the reviews will be up by the middle, hopefully, uh, of December. And then I'll officially launch the site in 2020. All right, enough with the advertisement there. Uh, but thank you for our sponsor, which was me. Okay, um, I've invested a lot of time and a lot of money in that. So anyway, there's the plug. Let us uh, take, what I'll probably do with these sessions is answer 15 questions and then uh, stop the video and then I'll answer another 15 questions and that'll be another video. We'll see how it runs, see how uh, challenging the particular questions are and how long the video runs in doing that. I hope you like this format. Let me know in the comments section and tell me if this works. All right, I'll take this one as the, well, maybe we'll see how long it takes to answer this one and we'll see how many more we go for this particular video. Uh, Rob asks, while many businesses can clearly be defined as B2B or B2C, how does one approach a CRM, a CRM strategy where both are involved? Well, Rob, I kind of touched on this in uh, answering one of the questions at the beginning of this. Uh, to me, See, one of the reasons I believe that I've been successful in B2B, maybe not so much for growing my own business, successful in advising the CRM systems or approaches to uh, my B2B clients, uh, is, and the reason why my own B2B is not so successful is I hate sales. Just quick tangent, Rob. I hate sales because I'm a pure marketer. And what does that mean? Well, as a pure marketer, I believe that my brand should speak for itself and it should be so good that it will be recommended to others so I won't ever have to pitch for work. It will just come to me. And yeah, I know, crazy. But it actually was sustainable. It's been sustainable in several businesses that I've owned. Uh, and it was quite sustainable in the current play that I'm in uh, until the economy shook a bit. And until the client base due to the ecosystem that I'm in here got smaller so that that network of people that I had done that work for were no longer in market to recommend me for further work. Uh, or redundancies happened and that person wasn't in that organization anymore. Or due to downsizing, there wasn't budget. So you have to be selling. And I recognize that, I know that. Uh, that's just not something that I like to do. Anyway, how did I get on that tangent? Yes, B2B. 
So B2B is very different in that situation in that you always have to be building those relationships, those one-on-one -on -one relationships, maintaining them and expanding them because they will shrink quickly, especially in a situation like I just outlined. In B to C, it's really about trends and it's about buzz and it's about new product offerings or new services. And B2B and B2C really differ in that as I indicated answering a prior question that it, B2C is about hitting that individual at the right time at the right price and being able to instantly close them. B2B is about reaching out to one or more individuals today for when they are ready for your product or service, when they have budget for it. It's such a long drawn out process. And larger businesses can survive because they are constantly farming, constantly so planting and constantly harvesting or nurturing. Smaller businesses, unless they are really focused on that, will face droughts when the marketplace is not ideal. And we're certainly not an ideal marketplace here. Uh, but how do you approach it? How do you approach it both? It's just really about understanding the process that I keep talking about and just really knowing that regardless of whether it's a B2B or B2C customer over here, it's about taking away the right data points from them, knowing them, fostering them, nurturing them while they're your customer, while they may be a lead, and maybe they've left you and maintaining a conversation with them even after they've gone, not burning bridges with them, right? And not hammering them all the time, not being in a nuisance, but letting them know that you're there and through the channel that they've said that they want to be reached out on and saying, you know, hey, why don't you come back? Or, you know, hey, we've got this new product or idea or service that we're about to launch. Here's how you can, um, you know, it, we think it would be good for you because of. So there's a, just a number of ways that you can use the same model of brand, product service, channel, and audience, customer, or consumer, and create an ecosystem of feedback or a conversation that, um, that works. Okay, uh, all right, we'll do, let's see, one more. Okay, how can, uh, this one's easy, I think, same. Um, how can companies use social media for customer service? Well, we chat, Twitter, I think are platforms best suited for this because they are post a question in a finite uh, number of characters and we are then able to respond to you publicly as well as reach out to you privately. Uh, I know a number of brands, of course, use social, other social channels, uh, but Instagram and Facebook Facebook can be effective in this way, uh, but probably not the best. Uh, so I, I would leave it to things like, I, I, Snap could be, it really, again, depends upon, right here, this segment. It depends upon your, your customer, consumer, what their preference is, and then utilizing the channel that best works for them. So certainly, a social post is one way, a direct message through that social posting platform or social site platform is another. 
Uh, I mean, I use LinkedIn for 90% of my business engagement and all facets. So that's the initial conversation, that's building the relationship, that's sharing value added content, that's closing the contract, uh, that's um, chatting sometimes with the customer. So just about everything can be achieved through the company profile on LinkedIn. And so that works, but can also be achieved through, through Twitter. You, or, or Instagram or WeChat or Facebook, whatever, right? Um, again, depending upon who that audience is, dictates that channel. Chatbots, of course, are a great entry point. So you have a website. Your website is available 24-7, 365. It should be anyway. If you have customers who are going to be asking you immediate questions, then you should have a chatbot with a substantial knowledge base for them to be able to engage. And if the chatbot is unable to resolve that situation adequately to the customer's satisfaction, the customer should then be given the ability to one of the following here. Either be asked for a callback and shouldn't be charged for that callback. I'm amazed that the brands that do that uh, be emailed back be connected directly to a live customer service person. If no one is available at customer service at that time of day for live chat, then they will be emailed back uh, for a time that they can connect on that live chat. Or you can connect directly to someone on the phone and, and have that interaction. And if not, then a callback is set up. But anyway, I think I covered that in those, those five. But those are some ways that um, customer service can be delivered on social effectively. I'm on a roll here, so I'm just going to keep going. Uh, Ashley asks, since, oh, sorry, Jack, since we know that the user experience is important, what tips can you share for a company needing to improve its user experience? Well, Ash, that's a, that's a tough one to answer because you didn't set up for me um, what is already being done, right? So, uh, I mean, there's some, some basic uh, premises, all right? And so then after the basics, here would be my tips. But, all right, so since we know that user experience is important, what tips can you share to for a company needing to improve so I don't know what they're doing wrong, so I'm not sure how to offer an improvement for them. Uh, some basic principles, though, are making sure that you understand the profile. So you utilize data to understand who your customer is. What are their likes, their dislikes, their wants, their needs, their desires? Uh, what are their preferent? What is their preferred uh, channel? Is it a live physical engagement in a retail store? Is it an e-commerce situation? Do they like video? Do they like chat? Do they want to be spoken to on the phone? I recently so all right so talk about user experience. I recently. Uh, have been consolidating my retirement plans and so over the course of my career I have worked for several organizations and then therefore have several 401k 4013s 457 anyway different um, a, uh, retirement accounts so I have been reaching out to these various financial institutions and trying to merge them into one or more uh, portfolios so that they're easier for me to manage and be able to really leverage you know the economies of scale of having a larger pot versus divided among smaller right but really it's about management so 
I have, and we know, anyway, okay, um, yeah, I don't want to mention the companies because then somebody will try to hack me, right? Uh, but anyway, just think about different financial institutions. Some of them have given me a personal rep that I'm either able to speak on the phone with. So I don't mean the home office. I mean a local rep that I can talk to or I can email with. And that, for me, being in Singapore, dealing with these and 13 hours at the moment ahead of Eastern Standard Time, has been fantastic for me to be able to email or call this individual and, you know, preferably though, the email piece to deal with them. Others don't have this. They just have a call center, which they just want your account number. They don't want to deal with you personally. They might, they do have a CRM, but I swear they don't ever read the data when they're dealing with you because you need to share your entire story with them every single time. One of the tips that I will give is that when a customer contacts you and you have in your CRM the data about that particular situation, you should never ever again ask them to repeat what has happened with them. Because there's nothing that infuriates me more than needing to repeat myself especially when I have invested substantially in that particular product or service. And they technically are there to serve me. They are not someone over me. Uh, I'm really, really big on chain of command. So if I have people that report to me and some other, some capacity, I have a certain level of customer experience or customer. I, de I deliver a certain level, but I also have an expectation of what I will also be received back or how that transaction will go. And if that's not met, then my, then there's no customer service from me. It becomes okay. A, B is C. When a brand treats you that way, whoa, like, you got to be kidding me. All right, so some of them only have a call center. And that doesn't work for me, especially with my lifestyle being almost 100% digital. They don't allow you to contact them even through their website. No email, no secure message. I love these companies. Email is not secure. Uh, okay, well, but if I opt in or opt out of their security protocol, then it is acceptable. But of course, we could do a secure PDF with a password. That's secure, but no. Anyway, I had a very difficult time, and there's only two companies that really shined in that process out of multiple, and the rest failed. And Actually, I have been trying, not, not full time, of course, just in my spare time, over the course of about 10 years to consolidate, nine years to consolidate these. And I am happy to say that they were just consolidated last Friday. Uh, so Black Friday was the day that, uh, that finally a nine year quest of consolidation was complete. And it was really due to the fact that I was here in Singapore and some of these companies demanded that I speak to them on the phone, I physically meet them, I physically mail them a check in 2019, as opposed to why can't there be an electronic transfer? Bizarre to me. All right, uh, I think I hit on some of those, Ash. I know I didn't hit on all of it. I really need to know what the company is doing wrong before I can offer some tips on there, but it's really about understanding the channel that the customer wants to be spoken to on uh, as the best approach to um, what you would do to develop that service. But it should always be, it should, it, and so when we talk about personalization, personalization means that it needs to suit the needs of the customer. And then I know these banks, by the way, 
oh, well, under, you know, federal blah, 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 under this Securities Act. Yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> As if you guys actually adhere to policies when it suits you, right? <sighs> All right, this will be my final question because actually we've gone through, I think, a full round here. Uh, and this will be the final one for this video today. And this one asks, do we think it is better for a company to focus generally on good customer service or should B2C companies consider it less than B2B? If that is the case, what do we think the impact is on B2C companies? Will they still be in a good position? Uh, all companies need to focus on good customer service, regardless of whether it's B2B or B2C. Uh, I think that both B2B and B2C company will both fail if they continually offer bad customer uh, service or a bad customer experience or continue to offer inferior products. So it's really about how long you want to be in business or how many customers you have. There's also a cost of doing business, right? So we haven't talked about that one yet. Now, let's talk about Singapore for a minute. And let me give you a quick glimpse of the marketplace. It's expensive to live in Singapore. It's expensive to do business in Singapore. Goods and services, well, goods generally are higher here than anywhere else I've ever done business in, uh, certainly anywhere that I've ever lived in. The only thing with economies of scale that's less would be local food. And that would be from not even a food court. We have outdoor food courts. They're called uh, hawker centers. Think about Faneuil Hall, but if Faneuil Hall were reasonably priced, <laughs> okay? So, uh, and these aren't tourist locations. These are local locations that locals eat at and it is some of the best Asian and international cuisine you could ever ask for at a reasonable price. Outside of that, the cost of doing business in Singapore is incredibly high and that would be the rental. Uh, so let's talk retail for a minute. That would be the rental for the retail shop. That would be wages for the employee. Uh, and it's not really so much the, the actual wages, it's the employment pass to have that employee in your shop, the hoops that you need to go after to get that. And I believe there's a ratio of, um, it, it's, almost, it's almost above 50% of local employees to foreign talent. And the foreign talent would be the one that would cost you less, but the hoops to get that talent is, it becomes, is becoming increasingly difficult in the country. So all that being said, if I'm a retail, and also that would be F&B, a business owner in Singapore, and I know that I've got a closed market of say potentially five million customers that they have they have choices but they don't have the same amount of choices that you might have in the u.s and one's ability because most people do not have a car by choice also because it's exceptionally expensive but i wouldn't i don't feel the need to own a car in singapore i prefer to take the bus and the train but that does sort of limit my food choices. Well, in Singapore, the thought process by most, especially F&B, if not retail, is that if not you, there will be another customer behind you. And also, there's really not an appetite to complain in Singapore about retail or F&B services because there's been a history of no repercussions for doing bad business. 
And so that being said, if I own a business, if I'm going to hold the hand of a customer that has not enjoyed the experience, it might cost me more than if I just tell the customer, see ya, and the customer doesn't come back. Because if it's not that customer, there's 4,999,099 blah, 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 to take that person's place. Uh, another example, too, is about enforcement. In the U.S., especially in Massachusetts, with the Better Business Bureau, there's a higher level or standard that uh, the business must live up to, or they will face repercussions from the government and then, of course, the law. When I had my home, so this wonderful marketing kitchen here, when I had the marketing kitchen and the rest of uh, my condo fully renovated, like I had everything ripped out except for the marble floors that were here and the, um, the, uh, the pine wood floor that I had in the bedroom. So just, you know, a little sanding and polish and the pine was great and the marble just needed a little bit of uh, polish, uh, you know, a little bit of sanding, a little fine grind and polish. And marble's expensive, so why rip it out? Uh, I'd prefer marble over homogeneous tiles any day. So outside of that, I had the entire place gutted. And I hired who I thought was going to be a good design and construction company. And you know what? They were horrible. And the name of that company is The Mind Design. And I have no problem saying that the owner of The Mind Design and that firm, The Mind Design, should go out of business because they were absolutely horrible. Now, I took them through to this organization called CASE, which is similar to the Better Business Bureau. And they found in my favor that he needed to rectify all of the faulty work and mistakes that were made. And I was actually quite benevolent because I had an initial list of about 30 defects, which I narrowed down to about five. And those are what I decided I'd go after. And that is what the organization case, the government body, said that he needed to fix. Now he signed a contract and I signed a contract saying that he would fix them. So he began to fix some of my cabinets, because this was all custom cabinetry here, and he did a worse job fixing them than what I wanted fixed. So I immediately put a halt to that, and I said that they've got to be to this standard or nothing. So you know what he said? He gave me the finger, basically, and took off. Now, if I want to go after him, I have to file a lawsuit against him. And anyway, there's just no, there's no teeth to the system here. And it's just a fight, I guess, that's not worth it. Though, every chance I get on social, I'm happy to say that the mind design should be out of business and never use them for your renovation pro project here in Singapore. Okay, uh, so I hope that answers your question that whether it's B2B or B2C, that customer uh, service is important because if you want to grow and sustain, so if you want to sustain and you want to grow your business, you've got to be having satisfied customers that, with word of mouth, will share the joy of doing business with you. Because in today's social age, that can have more weight than even you doing an ad campaign. But again, it really it dictates your brand, the channel, the customer, and then, of course, the environment. As I mentioned, in a place like Singapore, 
where there isn't that enforcement, then the brand can pretty much get away with what it wants and it might be better for them to ignore you than to rectify the, the, the cost of rectification may be greater than retaining you as a customer. And not just in the US though, uh, Target for example and Best Buy, they actually have a naughty customer list and uh, check Google, for, Google and check that out. But there are customers that um, return products too frequently and have been known to like swap items out or use stuff and then return it. They're put into the CRM system of companies like Target and companies like Best Buy and those customers are prohibited from returning any more products. And again, that's one of those cost of doing business issues where this customer has cost me more money than they're bringing in, so then therefore why should I have them as a customer? All right, I hope you enjoyed uh, this segment. I enjoyed talking about customer service, customer experience, B2B and B2C uh, with you with loyalty and rewards. I found this to be a rewarding exchange now that the tech issues seem to be resolved with this format, though it's not what I wanted, at least it's working and at least I can get a video out to you, unlike uh, what had been happening for the past couple of days. Uh, the reason why, it's not only that I've been super busy working on AppFlix that uh, that I was unable to get these videos out. It's because I've been facing a number of tech issues with recording them. And imagine recording a 45 minute video and then there not being any sound. And that happened to me. And it wasn't because I connected it wrong, just the mic didn't work. Maybe the the cord was loose, I, I don't know. And then today, the video, when I exit out, it just doesn't save. So, and that happened as well too when I recorded a few. <sighs> All right, for those of you that um, have not um, been here before or asked a question before, just go to Marketing Kitchen TV right here um, with, uh, at Marketing Kitchen TV use the hashtag as in this example right here, Q&A. Ask your question and I'll answer it right here. Thank you, I'll see you in the next video. That'll do it for this episode. I hope you found my answers useful. I hope that we can have some engagement on this channel by you offering some comments. Please make sure you subscribe to the channel. Please like it and please share with your friends. It will really help the channel to grow, which in turn will help me and make this a better resource for us all. Thank you for your question. If you'd like me to answer a question here on Marketing Kitchen TV, all you need to do is go to the at Marketing Kitchen TV on Twitter, use the hashtag Q&A, and I will answer your questions here. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Remember, there's always fresh content simmering on our storytelling stovetop. So whatever happens in this kitchen shouldn't stay in this marketing kitchen. I'm Ron Vining, your host, reminding you to invite your family and friends to the next episode of Marketing Kitchen TV.